The following message was delivered at Westminster Presbyterian on November 12, 2023. The speaker is the Reverend Jim Cassidy. The message is based upon Hebrews chapter 2 verses 1 through 4, and it is titled Pay Attention. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. This is the word of God. Pay attention. If you are anybody in this congregation, you have either said those words or you have heard them spoken to you. Parents, you have said it to your children. Pay attention. Teachers, if there are teachers here, you have said it to your students. Pay attention. If you are a child here this evening, you have heard it said to you by your parents and by your teachers, pay attention. Because what you are about to hear is very important. The author to the Hebrews here exhorts God's people to give heed, pay attention. And as we approach chapter 2, and we read those opening words, therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. You may ask yourself, what is it that we are to pay attention to? And in order to understand what the author here is getting at, we need to set the backdrop and the context. In chapter 1, the author opens up with an explanation of the difference between the mode of revelation that God gave beforehand. And he has particularly in view the times of the Old Testament. And he talked about how long ago and in various and sundry ways God spoke by the prophets. He spoke to our fathers by the prophets. And then he brings that way of speaking in the Old Testament in contrast with the way in which he has spoken under the New Covenant, namely in and through Jesus Christ. In these last days, he says, God has spoken to us by way of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on and he talks about angels. And he brings Jesus in comparison to angels in chapter 1, verses 5 to the end of the chapter. And what is in view there is that Jesus is greater than the angels. Just like how Jesus' mode of revelation given now under the new covenant is superior to the mode of revelation that was given to the old. Now, don't get me wrong. The revelation that God gave in the Old Testament and that which is the Old Testament is in fact the inspired, the in inerrant and infallible word of God. What you have in your Bibles in all of the Old Testament is the perfectly true word of God. The author is not telling us that somehow it is less than divine revelation. He's not denigrating it. What he is saying is that what has come in Jesus Christ is a better word than what came before. It's not to say that the word that came before is a worse word. It's not a bad word. But the word 
that comes now in and through the person and the work of Jesus Christ is even better than what had come before. And the author will go on and he'll explain why, because under the old, what we have there is anticipation. We have shadows and we have types. It's an anticipation of the Christ to come, but now we have the Christ come. And all of the old covenant types, pictures and shadows have been fulfilled in him. And that's why it's a better word. But also, as he brings in comparison Jesus and the angels, Jesus, we are told, is better than the angels. And the reason why Jesus is better than the angels is because he's higher than the angels. The angels are living creatures, but Jesus is the living creator. Jesus is not made, but the angels are made. The angels, they change, but Jesus remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. Talks about the heavens, the way in which they will perish, verse 11. Like a robe, they will be rolled up. But look at what it says about Jesus, verse 12 of chapter 1. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. He is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He has no beginning of days. He has no end of days. He is the Alpha. He is the Omega. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is from everlasting to everlasting, Jesus. And therefore... Jesus, the better revelation of God, is himself God who creates all things. Therefore, in light of all of that, in light of the superiority of Jesus, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. Much closer attention relative to what? to the messages that were delivered to the people of old. And in particular, what the author to the Hebrews has in mind here is the message that was delivered by the angels to Mo- through Moses to the people of Israel, particularly on Mount Sinai. You remember it, don't you? What a revelation that was. The giving of of the law on Mount Sinai. What was that scene like? Do you remember? Was it tranquil? Peaceful. A nice oasis in the desert. A place to go on vacation. Not at all. You remember it, don't you? There are peals of thunder. And when the word was delivered by the angels to Moses in order to be given to Israel, the message came with lightning and smoke. And it was a fearful presentation. In fact, we are told that no one was to even touch the mountain upon which Moses ascended. To meet with God to receive the law. And the threat for touching the mountain, because it was holy ground, and the people of Israel, though the holy people of God were unholy in their sin and in their unrighteousness. And it was told to them, not even the animals may touch the mountain, because if they do, if you do, you are struck dead. That's the threat, death. The wages of sin is death. What a fearful scene. Therefore, in light of the message that has now been received, 
by the people of the Hebrews. They must pay much closer attention to what it is they have heard. What have they heard? The author will unpack it a little bit later here, but we know that the message that they have heard is the message of the gospel. What is in view here is the better word, the better revelation they have heard about Jesus. And we know how that works. In the book of Acts, after Jesus has commissioned the apostles to go forth and to preach the gospel, they take the message of the gospel and they go and they preach it and people hear it. And in hearing it, they believe. And in believing, they get saved and they form a church. These Jewish believers have had that experience. They have heard the gospel. They have heard about Jesus. They have believed upon him. But the author here is very concerned about them. The concern that he has for them is, as it says at the end of verse 1, that they might drift away from it. And this is why they are to pay much more closer attention to the gospel that they have heard, lest they drift away from it. Can you appreciate the gospel is not the kind of thing that believers hear only at the beginning of the Christian life. It's not the kind of thing that only unbelievers need to hear that they might be converted. But the gospel is the kind of thing that every Christian believer must constantly hear again and again and again and again. Lest we drift away from it. The message of the gospel stands here for the author in an interesting juxtaposition to the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. The giving of the law brings terror. Why? Because the law is not the gospel. The law is there to expose sin. And when the law, the holy righteous requirements of God, come in contact with sinful creatures, the law exposes the sin within that creature. Because the creature has not kept the law. And the law requires one thing with regard to people who break it. Death. Judgment. The law does not bring salvation. The law cannot save. The gospel is what saves. And so, the exhortation of our author here to pay much closer attention is an argument going from the lesser to the greater. If it is... In fact, a message given under the law that was to be paid attention to, how much more is it that the gospel must constantly be heeded and heard, listened to, paid attention to, lest we drift away from it? As he goes on to say in verse 2, for since the message declared by angels, that's the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, that was delivered to Moses by the mediatorship of angels. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. There it is again. An explanation as to exactly what the law did the law demands obedience what is the nature of the obedience that the law requires the law requires perfect personal 
perpetual, exact, and entire obedience of the ones to whom the law is given. God does not cut corners. When he gives the law, he doesn't sort of massage it so as to accommodate those who are unable to to obey it. He never waters down the righteous requirements of the law so as to accommodate us weak creatures in our weakness or in our frailty. God at no point says, okay, that bar's too high for you. Let me go ahead and just lower that for you. He doesn't do that. The righteous requirements of the law is perfection. And you need to understand that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ in the new covenant is not that Jesus comes along and he makes the law easier to obey. That's a misconception in the minds of many of our fellow Christian friends. But that is not what happens when we move from the old to the new. It's not that the, that the righteous requirements of the old covenant get easier. It's that in the new covenant, the righteous requirements of the law get fulfilled perfectly, personally, exactly, and entirely by Jesus Christ. It is not that the new covenant comes along and what the new covenant does is enable you to meet the standard at any time before your transition into glory. The transition from the old covenant to the new covenant highlighting the nature of the new covenant is not that the new covenant makes you a better person, it's that the new covenant in Jesus Christ has fulfilled all the righteous requirements on your behalf, that you might stand in the presence of God, clothed in the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ and not exposed as naked and guilty in your sin. But back to verse 2. The message was reliable. Every transgression received retribution. That's right. It received retribution. And not just on Mount Sinai, by the way. It's not like, by the way, it's not like when a sinner sins, which we saw plenty of it in the course of the Old Covenant and in the New and in our own lives. It's not as if when God does not strike that sinner dead right there and then that somehow, some way, God has sort of like forgotten that that sin occurred. Every sin under the righteous requirements of the law will receive its just retribution. No sin goes unpunished. God never, ever turns a blind eye to sin. It always receives its just retribution. The only question is, in whom is the retribution Received. We know King David. We know many of his sins. We don't know all of his sins, but we know we know some of his sins that are given to us in Scripture. David was not struck dead in the moment in which he committed those sins. Do you think that God just sort of waived the retribution required for those sins? No, of course not. So if David, who we trust is in heaven right now, enjoying the presence of the triune God, if David did not receive that just retribution in himself, and God bears retribution for all sins, 
or brings retribution for all sins, then who bore David's retribution for his sins? Of course, it is Jesus. Jesus, who all the iniquities of his people, all of the iniquities of those that he has loved from before the foundations of the earth were placed upon him on the cross. And there the wrath of God was poured upon him. And there he received the retribution that David's sins and that your sins deserve. The law, according to verse 2, that was declared by the angels, brings fearful retribution. Every transgression received its just retribution. The law brings condemnation. Verse 3, how then, and here's the key question, how then shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? If sinners under the old covenant according to the giving of the law did not escape the wrath to come how would we expect that we would escape the wrath to come if we neglect such a great salvation now what the author to the Hebrews is not saying here is that the that the gospel is just sort of like another law, right? Somehow uh, a greater, more intense law, so that the argument is not so that if in the lesser law that was given on Mount Sinai people receive just retribution, how much more in the new law of the gospel will people receive just retribution for? Rejecting the gospel. That's not what the author is saying. You need to understand that sinners go to hell not because they don't believe the gospel. They go to hell because of the sins that they have committed even before they heard the gospel. The sin that is theirs by virtue of Adam's first sin, imputed to them by way of ordinary generation. Rejecting the gospel is just the latest sin that somebody commits. It's not as if somebody was perfectly, this is the Arminian argument, right? It's not as if somebody was traveling along perfectly okay, you know, a relatively good person living in society and then hears the gospel and then rejects it and now they're going to hell. Not at all. They were already going to hell even before they heard the gospel. So the reason why the author here tells us how, or asks the rhetorical question, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation, is the fact that we are already going to hell by nature and by our actual sins. <clears throat> and there's only one way to escape that just retribution for our sin and the sin of Adam. That is ours. And that is through Jesus Christ and the gospel. And so the author asking this rhetorical question, then how shall we escape? We won't escape. Because if the law was effectual, how much more is the gospel effectual for the salvation of sinners? If the law is effectual for the condemnation of sinners, how much more is the better word, the word that is a better word spoken than all the words of the prophets that came before Jesus, if that word is true, then Absolutely, we cannot escape if we neglect it because it is true. It is good news. The promises contained within the gospel are sure and they are yours if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. How will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? The problem 
with the believers to whom the author is writing is that they have become somewhat nostalgic. Their nostalgia is leading them away from Christ. They're looking back to the Old Covenant law. They're looking back to the Old Covenant temple and the Old Covenant worship and the Old Covenant priesthood. And they are pining after the good old days. Now, you could imagine, if the book of Hebrews was written after 70 AD, we don't know when it was written for sure, but if it was written after 70 AD, you could imagine that there are believers in the congregation pining after the old law and its old worship and its old temple who are saying to themselves, let's just build a new temple, a third one. Let's get those sacrifices back ramped up again. Let's find ourselves some priests to offer the sacrifices and to lead us in worship. Oh, it sounds pious on the surface, doesn't it? We just want what the Bible tells them. The Bible tells them, build a temple. The Bible tells them, do worship this way, do it that way. They're reading their Old Testament scriptures and they're just trying to be obedient to what it is that God revealed under the Old Covenant. But the danger that they are finding themselves in is that in their looking to a previous time, a different epoch in redemptive history and the revelation that is commensurate with it, they are taking their eyes off of Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of their faith. All under the guise of pious religious devotion to the scriptures of the Old Testament. If you read your Bibles and you do so in a way that is devoid of Christ, you may be in danger of neglecting such a great salvation and drifting away from it that salvation. If you read your Old Testament Bibles and there you are looking for a program of self-improvement or looking for a program of social transformation and not the revelation of the Christ to come, you may be in danger of taking your eyes off Jesus and drifting away. The author here gives the most stern warnings possible to the believers, the Jewish believers to whom he writes. How shall you escape? Don't take your eyes off of him. He goes on and he explains in verse 3, the second half of it, what it is this salvation is. He says, it was declared at first by the Lord, that's Jesus, when Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And it was attested to us by those who heard, that's the apostles. So there was a process, right? Jesus came preaching the good news, the good news of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom of God and its arrival in him. And then the apostles, as we were talking about this morning, after they sort of went through a real awkward situation and moment in their lives and in their ministry of denying Jesus. Finally, they get it. They go out and they preach. And they take that message of the gospel so that others hear it. And others have heard it. So this is how we know going back that we that the author here has in mind that that which we are to pay most close attention to is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. And we know this, don't we? That when the gospel early on particularly in the book of Acts, went forth and it was proclaimed among the Gentiles, not just the Gentiles, but also the Jews. 
We know from the book of Acts that the apostles also performed certain signs and wonders that went along with the preaching of the gospel as signs and seals of the gospel that they had just preached. And Jesus, of course, did something similar, right? When he came preaching the gospel, he used miracles and other signs and wonders in order to to be signs and seals of the message of the nature of the kingdom that he came to preach. Now, we know that as with Jesus, as with the apostles, the healings, for example, that he performed were not healings that were intended for and in themselves. In other words, Jesus did not heal people because he was giving us a model for church ministry today. That we ought to do healings of other people. That it's all about just extending this earthly life. Not at all. The miracles, particularly if we bring into view the healings, are seals and they are signs of the healing that Jesus comes to bring as he bears our sins and redeems us from them. And delivers us from the just wrath to come. All of the signs, all of the wonders that are given to us in the Gospels are given for this purpose. They are visible signs of the spiritual, invisible reality of the redemptive nature of the kingdom of God. And so, we must pay much closer attention to this. Now, this doesn't mean read your Old Testament Bibles less than you read your New Testament Bible, right? That's not what he's saying. He's not saying if the preacher is coming to you with an Old Testament passage, you could sort of half check out, but really check in if it's a New Testament passage. (laughs) That's not what he's saying. What he is saying is that the law given under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, fully the word of God, is a message that brings bad news. It exposes your sins and it warns you that you are on your way to hell. But the gospel, the gospel is what heals you. The gospel is what delivers you. Because it is the gospel of Jesus Christ who died and gave his life for you that you might forever live in him. That's the message that you must always fix your eyes upon. That is the message that you must need and desire to hear from this pulpit, Sunday after Sunday. That is the message, the word of the gospel, which you must bear in mind as you read your Bibles from Genesis to Revelation, that you might do so and understand them in the light of Christ and the good news that in him you can be delivered from the wrath to come. Pay attention. Give your mind to it. Give your heart to it. And give your very lives to it. That all praise and glory might be unto our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, both now and forevermore. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and the word of the gospel. And we pray that you might... Give us grace that we might give our attention to it always. Keep us from drifting away by anchoring our hearts in the deep ocean and deep seas of the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
For more messages like the one you just heard, visit Westminster Presbyterian online or in person at westminsterbartlesville.org or in person at the corner of Adams and Chickasaw in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. We meet every Lord's Day at 10.30 in the morning and 5 p.m. in the evening. We'd be glad to have you.